Hey crew, it's Pitt, and I am back with some more ancient lore. Today we are going to be continuing our discussion on the Corpus Hermeticum, which is the wisdom of Hermes, the thrice great Hermes, as translated by GRS Mead. We are reading aloud from four chapters today. It will be on thought and sense, the key mind unto Hermes, and about the common mind. So we are dealing with thinking and how it should be. Let's dig in and see what's up. <clears throat> On thought and sense, that the beautiful and good is in God only in elsewhere, nowhere. I gave the perfect sermon yesterday, Asclepius. Today, I think it right as sequel thereunto to go through, point by point, the sermon about sense. Now, sense and thought do differ, do seem to differ, in that the former has to do with matter and the latter has to do with substance, but unto me... Both seem to be at one and not to differ. In men, I mean. In other lives, sense is at one with the nature, but in men, thought. Now, mind doth differ just as much from thought as God doth from divinity. For that divinity by God doth come to be, and by mind, thought, the sister of the word, and instruments of one another. For neither doth a word find utterance without thought, nor is thought manifested without word. So sense and thought flow together into man, as though they were entwined with one another. For neither without sensing can one think, nor without thinking sense. But it is possible to think a thing apart from sense, as those who fancy sights and dreams. But unto me it seems that both of these activities occur in dream sight, and sense doth pass out of the sleeping and the waking to the waking state. <clears throat> For man, <clears throat> for man is separated into soul and body, and only when the two sides of his sense agree together does utterance of his thought, conceived by mind, take place. For it is mind that doth conceive all thoughts, good thoughts, when it receives the seeds from God, their contraries when it receives them from one of the demonals, demonals. No part of cosmos being free of demon who stealthily doth creep unto the demon who's illumined by God's light, and so in him the seed of its own energy. And mind conceives the seed thus thrown, adultery, murder, parricide, sacrilege, impiety, and strangling, casting down precipices, and all other such other deeds as are the work of even evil demons. The seeds of God, tis true, are few, but vast and fair. And good, virtuous and self-control, virtue and self-control, devotion. Devotion is God gnosis, for he who knoweth God, being filled with all good things, thinks godly thoughts, and not thoughts of the many. For this cause they who are Gnostic please not the many, nor the many them. They are thought mad and laughed at, they're hated and despised, and sometimes even put to death. For we did say that bad must needs dwell here on earth, where tis in its own place. Its place is earth, and not cosmos, as some will sometimes say with impious tone. But he who is a devotee of God will bear with all, once he has sensed the gnosis. For such an one all things, even though they be for others bad, are for him good. Deliberately he doth refer them all unto the gnosis, and, thing most marvelous, Tis he alone who maketh bad things good. But I return once more to the discourse on sense, that sense doth share with thought in man, doth constitute him man. But tis not every man, as I have said, who benefits by thought. For this man is material, that other one substantial. For the material man, as I have said, with the bad doth have his seed of thought from demons, while the substantial men, consorting with the good, are saved by God. Now God is maker of all things, and in his making he maketh all like to himself. But they, while they're becoming good by exercise of their activity, are unproductive things. It is the working of the cosmic course that maketh their becomings what they are, befouling them, some of them with bad, and others of them making clean with good. For cosmos too, Asclepius, possesseth sense and thought peculiar to itself, not unlike that of man, Tis not so manifold, but, as it were, a better and simpler one. The single sense and thought of cosmos is to make all things and make them back into itself again, as organ of the will of God, so organized 
that it, receiving the seeds into itself from God and keeping them within itself, may make all manifest, and then dissolving them make them all new again. And thus, like a good gardener of life, things that have been dissolved, it taketh to itself and giveth them renewal once again. There is no thing to which it gives not life, but taking all unto itself it makes them live and is at the same time the place of life and its creator. Now bodies, matter made, are in diversity. Some are of earth, of water some, and some are of air, and some of fire. But they are all composed. Some are more composite, and some are more simpler. The heavier ones are more, the, are more, the lesser, the lighter, less so. It is the speed of cosmos's course that works the manifoldness to the kinds of births. For being a most swift breath, it doth bestow their qualities on bodies together with one pleroma, that of life. God then is sire of cosmos, cosmos of all in cosmos, and cosmos is God's son, but things in cosmos are by cosmos. And, <clears throat> and properly hath it been called cosmos, for that it orders all with their diversity of birth, with it not leaving aught without its life, with the unweariness of its activity, the speed of its necessity, the composition of its elements, and order of its creatures. The same, then, of necessity and of propriety should have the name order. The sense and thought, then, of all lives doth come into them from without, and breathe by what contains them all. Whereas cosmos receives them all, them once for all together with its coming into being and keeps them as gifts from God. But God is not, as some suppose, beyond the reach of sense and thought. It is through superstition that men thus impiously speak. For all the things that are, Asclepius, all are in God and brought by God to be and do depend on Him. Both things that act through bodies and things that act through soul substance make other things move, and things that make things live by means of spirit, and things that take unto themselves the things that are worn out. And rightly so, nay, I would rather say, he doth not have these things, but I speak forth the truth, he is them all himself. He doth not get them from without, but gives them out from him. This is God's sense and thought ever to move all things, and never time shall be when even a wit of things that are shall cease. And when I say a wit of things that are, I mean a wit of God, for things that are God hath, nor aught is there without him, nor is he without aught. These things should seem to thee, Asclepius, if thou dost understand them, true. But if thou dost not understand, things not to be believed. To understand is to believe. To not believe is to not understand. My word doth go before thee to the truth, but mighty is the mind, and when it has been led, up, word, led by word up to a certain point, it hath the power to come before thee to the truth. And having thought all over these things, and found them consonant with those which have already been translated by reason, it hath believed and found its rest in that fair faith. To those then who by God's good aid do understand the things that have been said by us above, they're credible, but unto those who understand them not, incredible. Let so much then suffice on thought and sense. And so ends uh, on thought and sense. And what we have here is a basic explanation of the nature of God. God is Right, We talk about this already, and we will talk about it again. God is all things. He is me, he is you. He is the space between me and you, and he is the space between the space me, between me and you. He is the microphone I'm talking to and the, the screen that you are watching it on, and he is all things. He is the breath that fills your lungs and the water that makes up your body. He is all things. If you understand that, and you understand that the key, the commandment, the the thing that you are supposed to hold to is love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. If you do that in its simplicity, you hold to all of the commandments from the Old Testament. If you love God, then you do not steal. If you love your neighbor, you don't commit adultery. If you are 
living as though you love God and yourself, then all the commandments are irrelevant. You are already going to hold to them because you know that that's not your property. You're not going to take it. You know that that's not your spouse. You're not going to do things with it. You know that you're lying, so you're not going to do it. If you are truly of God, these things are of you. Because God is all things. He is you. You are not him, but he is you. He is the thing that makes you up. You are a very tiny piece of him, along with everything else. Everything that you have ever seen constitutes a single molecule in the fingernail of God. It is so incredibly tiny, and yet still a part. Okay, so next we're going to get into the key of thrice great Hermes. Hermes. My discourse, my yesterday's discourse, I did devote to thee, Asclepius, and so tis only right. I should devote today's to Tat. And this the more, because tis the abridgment of the general sermons, which he has had addressed to him. God, Father, and the good, and Tat hath the same nature, or, more exactly, energy. For nature is a predicate of growth, and used of things that change, both mobile and immobile, that is to say, both human and divine. Each one of them he willeth into being. But energy consists in something else, as we have shown in treating of the rest, both things divine and human things, which thing we ought to have in mind when treating of the good. God's energy is then his will. Further, his essence is to his essence is to will the being of all things. For what is God and Father and the good, but the to be of all that are not yet? Nay, subsistence itself is everything that is. This, then, is God, this Father, this is the good. To him is added naught of the rest. And, though the cosmos, that is to say the Son, is also sire himself to them that share in him, Yet so far he is not the cause of good unto the lives, he is not even of their living. So that even if he be a sire, he is entirely so by the compulsion of the good's good will, apart from which nor being nor becoming could ever be. Again, the parent is in the children's cause, both on the father's and the mother's side, only by sharing in the good's desire that doth pour through the son. It is the good which doeth the creating, and such a power can be possessed by no one else than him alone who taketh not, but wills all things to be. I will not, Tat, say makes, for that the maker is defective for long periods, in which he sometimes makes and sometimes doth not make, both in the quality and in the quantity of what he makes, and that he sometimes maketh them so many and such alike, and sometimes the reverse, but <clears throat> God and Father and the good is cause for all to be. So are at least these things for, the, for who can see. For it doth will to be, and it is both itself and most of all by reason of itself. Indeed, all other things beside are just because of it. And for the distinctive feature of the good that is that it should be known. Such is the good, O Tat. Tat. Thou hast, O Father, filled us so full of this so good and fairest sight, that thereby my mind's eye hath now become for me almost a thing to worship. For that the vision of God of good doth not, like the sun's beam, fire like blaze on the eyes, and make them close. Nay, on the contrary, it shineth forth, and make to increase the seeing of the eye, as far as every man hath the capacity to hold the inflow of the radiance that the mind alone can see. Not only does it come more swiftly down to us, but it does us no harm and is instinct with all immortal life. They who are able to drink in somewhat more than others of this sight, oft times from out of the body fall asleep in this fair spectacle, as was the case with Uranus and Cronus, our forebears. May this be our lot too, O father mine. Hermes. Yes, it may be, my son, but as it is, we are not yet strong to the vision, and not as yet have we the power, our mind's eye, to unfold and gaze upon the beauty of the good, beauty that naught can ever be corrupted, nor 
and he can comprehend. For then wilt thou upon it gaze, when thou canst say no word concerning it, for gnosis of the good is holy science, silence, and giving holiday to every sense. For neither can he who perceiveth it perceive aught else, nor he who gazeth on it gaze on aught else, nor hear aught else, nor stir his body in any way. Staying his body's every sense and every motion, he stayeth still, and shining then all around his mind, it shines through his whole soul and draws it out of his body, transforming all of him to essence. For it is possible, my son, that a man's soul should be made like to God's, even while it is still in a body, if it doth contemplate the beauty of the good. Teote, made like to God, what dost thou, Father, mean? Hermes, of every soul apart from transformation, son. What meanest thou apart? Didst thou not, in the general sermons, hear that from one soul, the all soul, comes all these souls, which are made to revolve in all the cosmos, as though divided off? Of these souls, then, it is that there are many changes, some to a happier lot, and some to just the contrary of this. Thus, some that were once creeping things change into things that in the water dwell. The souls of water things change to earth dwellers, and those that live on the earth change into things with wings. The souls that live in the air change into men, while human souls reach the first step of deathlessness, changed into demons. And so they circle the choir of the inerrant gods. For of the, go for of the gods there are two choirs, on the one, inerrant, and on the other, errant. And this is the most perfect glory of the soul. But if a soul, on entering in the body of a man, persisteth in its vice, in its vice, it neither tasteth deathlessness nor share in the good, but speeding back again it turns into the path that leads to creeping things. This is the sentence of the vicious soul. And the soul's vice is ignorance, for that soul who hath no knowledge of the things that are, or knowledge of their nature, or of good, is blinded by the body's passions and tossed about. This wretched soul, not knowing what she is, becomes a slave of bodies of strange form and sorry plight, bearing the body as a load, not as the ruler, but the ruled. This is the ignorance is the soul's vice. But on the other hand, the virtue of the soul is gnosis. For he who knows he good and pious is, and while still on the earth, divine. But who is such a one, O father mine? He who doth not say much, or lend his ear to much. For he who spendeth time in arguing and hearing arguments, doth shadow fight. For God, the father, and the good is not to be obtained by speech or hearing. <laughs> and yet, though this be so, there are in all the beings senses, and that they cannot without senses be. But gnosis is far different from sense, for sense is brought about by that which hath the mastery over us, while gnosis is the end of science, and science is God's gift. All science is incorporeal, the instrument it uses being the mind, just as the science employs as the mind employs the body. Both then come into bodies, I mean both things are cognizable by mind alone and things material. For all things must consist out of antithesis and contriety, and this can otherwise not be. <clears throat> Who then is this material God of whom thou speak? Cosmos is beautiful, but it is not good, for that it is material and freely passable, and though it is the first of all things passable, yet is it in the second rank of being and wanting in itself. And though it never hath itself its birth in time, but ever is, yet is it being in becoming, becoming for all time the genesis of qualities and quantities, for it is mobile in all material motions genesis. It is intelligible, rest that moves material motion in this way, since cosmos is a sphere, that is to say, a head, but and not of heads above material as not of feet below intelligible, but all material. And head itself moved in a sphere-like way, that is to say, as head should move as mind. All then that are united to the tissue of this head, in which is soul, are in their nature free from death, just as when body hath been made in soul, 
are things that have more soul than body. Whereas these things which are, are at a greater distance from this tissue, there where things which have a greater share of body than of soul, are by their nature subject unto death. The whole, however, is a life, so that the universe consists of both hylic and of the unintelligible. Again, the cosmos is the first of living things, while man is second after it, the first of things subject to death. <clears throat> man has the same ensouling power in him as all the rest of living things, Yet is he not only not good, but even evil, for that he's subject to death. For though the cosmos also is not good, in that it suffers motion, it is not evil, in that it is not subject unto death. But man, in that he's subject both to motion and to death, is evil. Now, now then the principles of man are this, wise vehicle, mind and the reason, and the reason of the soul, soul and the spirit, and spirit and the body. Spirit, pervading body by means of veins and arteries and blood, bestows upon the living creature motion, as it were, doth bear it away. For this cause some do think the soul is blood, and that they do mistake its nature, not knowing that at death it is the spirit that must first withdraw into the soul, whereupon the blood congeals and veins and arteries are emptied, and then the living creature is withdrawn, and this is body's death. Now, from source all things depend, while source dependeth from the one and the only one. Source is, moreover, moved to become source again, whereas the one standeth perpetually and is not moved. Three then are they, God, the Father, and the Good, Cosmos, and Man. God doth contain Cosmos, Cosmos containeth man, and Cosmos is ever God's son, man, as it were, Cosmos' child. Not that, however, God ignoreth man, nay, right well doth he know him, and willeth to be known. This is the soul's salvation for a man, God's gnosis. This is the way up to the mount. By him alone the son soul becomes good, not whiles is good, whiles evil, but good out of necessity. What does that mean, thrice greatest one? Behold, an infant soul, my son, that is not yet cut off, because its body is still small and has not yet come into its full bulk. How? A thing of beauty altogether is such a soul to see, yet not befouled by body's passions all, still, but, uh, still all but hanging from the cosmic soul. But when the body grows in bulk and draweth down the soul into its mass, then doth the soul cut off itself and bring upon itself forgetfulness, and no more shareth in the beautiful and good. And this forgetfulness becometh vice. It is the same for them who go out from the body. For when the soul withdraws into itself, the spirit doth contract itself within the blood, and soul within the spirit. And then the mind, stripped of its wrappings and naturally divine, taking unto itself a fiery body, doth traverse every space, after abandoning the abandoning the soul unto his judgment, and whatever chastisement it hath deserved. What do you mean, Father, by this? The mind is parted from the soul, and soul from spirit? Whereas you said that the soul was the mind's vesture, the soul is the spirit. The hearer's son should think with him who speaks and breathes within him. Nay, he should have a hearing subtler than the voice of him who speaks. It is, son, in a body, made of earth, that this arrangement of the vestures come to pass. For in a body made of earth it is impossible the mind should take its seat itself by its own self in nakedness. For neither is it possible, on the one hand, that the earthly body should contain such immortality, nor, on the other, that so great a virtue should endure a body, passable in such close contact with it. It taketh then the soul for it as it were an envelope and soul itself being to a thing divine doth use the spirit as its envelope while spirit doth pervade the living creature and when the mind doth free itself from the earth body it straightway putteth on its proper robe of fire with which it could not dwell in an earth body for earth do not bear fire for it is all set in a blaze even by a small spark 
and for this cause is water poured round earth to be a guard and wall to keep the blazing of the fire away but mind the swiftest thing of all divine outthinkings and swifter than all elements hath for its body fire for mind being builder doth use for the fire as a tool for the construction of all things the mind of all for all things but that of man only for things on earth stripped of its fire the mind on earth cannot make things divine for it is human in its dispensation the soul in man however not every soul but one that pious is is a demonic something and divine and such a soul when freed from when from the body freed if it have fought the fight of piety the fight of piety is to know god and to do wrong to no man such soul becomes entirely mind whereas the impious soul remains in its own essence chastised by its own self and seeking for an earthly body where to enter if only it be human for then no other body can contain a human soul nor is it right for any that human soul should fall into the body of a thing that doth possess no reason for that the law of god is this to guard the human soul from such tremendous outrage how father then is a man's soul chastised what greater chastisement of any human soul can there be son than lack of piety what fire has so fierce flame as lack of piety what ravenous beast so mauls the body as lack of piety the very soul dost thou not see what host of ills impious souls doth bear it shrieks and screams i burn i am ablaze i do not know what to cry or do ah wretched me i am devoured by all the ills that compass me about alack poor me i neither he see nor hear such are the cries wrung from a soul chastised not as a many think and thou son dost suppose that a man's soul passing from body is changed into a beast such is a very grave mistake for that way that the way that a soul doth suffer chastisement is this when mind becomes a demon the law requires that it should take a fiery body to execute the services of god and entering into the soul most impious it scourges it with whips made of its sins and then the impious soul scourged with his sins is plunged in murders outrage blasphemy in violence of all kinds and all the other things whereby mankind is wronged but on the pious soul the mind doth mount to guide it to the gnosis's light and such a soul doth never tire of the songs of praise to god and pouring blessings on all men and doing good word good in word and deed to all in imitation of its sire wherefore my son thou shalt give praise to god and pray that thou may have thy mind good it is then to a better state that soul doth pass it cannot to a worse further there is an intercourse of souls those of the gods have intercourse with those of the men and those of the men with souls of creatures which possess no reason the higher further have in charge of the lower the gods look after men the men after animals irrational while god hath charge of all for he is higher than them all and all are less than he cosmos is subject then to god man to cosmos and irrationals to man but god is over them all and god contains them all god's rays to use a figure are his energies and the cosmoses are natures the arts and sciences are man's the energies act through the cosmos thence the nature rays of cosmos upon man the nature rays through the elements man acteth through the sciences and arts this is the dispensation of the universe depending from the nature of the one pervading all things through the mind than which is not diviner or of greater energy and not a greater means for the atoning of men to gods and gods to men he is the good demon <clears throat> blessed the soul that is most filled with him and wretched is the soul that is empty of the mind father what does thou mean again dost thou think son that every soul hath the good mind for tis of him we speak not of the mind in service of which we were just speaking the mind sit down for the soul's chastisement for soul without the mind can neither speak nor act for oftentimes the mind doth leave the soul and at that time the soul nor sees nor understands but it is just like a thing that 
hath no reason. Such is the power of mind. Yet doth it not endure a sluggish soul, but leaveth such a soul tied to the body, and bound tight down by it. Such soul, my son, doth not have mind, and therefore such a one shall not be called a man. For that man is a thing of life divine. Man is not measured with the live, rest of lives of things upon the earth, but with the lives above in heaven, who are called gods. Nay, more, if we must speak boldly the truth, the true man is even higher than the gods. Or, at the very least, the gods and men are every wit and power each with the other equal. <clears throat> For no one of the gods in heaven shall come down on the earth, overstepping heaven's limit, whereas man doth mount up to heaven and measure it. He knows what things are of it are high, what things are low, and learns precisely all things else besides. And greater thing than all, without even quitting earth, he doth ascend above, so vast a sweep does he possess of ecstasy. For this cause can a man dare say that man on earth is God, subject to death, while God in heaven is man from death immune. Wherefore the dispensation of all things is brought about by means of these, the twain, cosmos and man, but by the one. And so ends the key of thrice great Hermes. And in this, we get quite a bit of knowledge. Things that we have talked about before, and we will definitely talk about again. There is a trinity. It is not Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It is not cosmos, man, and God. It is body, mind, and soul. Or body, mind, and spirit is a better way of putting it. You know, body, soul, and spirit. You have the body. That's the meat suit. That is the actual physical flesh. It does absolutely nothing without you inside of it. You have the mind, the soul, the part of God that is you. The very tiny fractional piece of the great God Almighty who is having your personal experience. <clears throat> it is the one that calls the shots on a day-to-day -day basis. It is the one that speaks so that it can be created. And then you have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the the creative force of all things and here it is attributed to the blood and that is not a bad place to put it although it is not exactly correct it is the thing that creates it is the thing that allows to happen it is the movement in time for neither your body nor your mind can move in time separate from the spirit otherwise you are not here you are elsewhere the spirit is what allows you to breathe it is what allows your blood to circulate through your bodies it is the part that when you inhale, moves the air outside into your lungs. And when you exhale, moves the little air inside, outside. It is the part that actually creates the things that are. The part that actually does. And without that, you have no life. That is what was contained in here for the most part. And it was also telling you that you have sovereignty over that. That you are indeed part of the divine. Right? We talk about that all the time. We just talked about it. I am God. You are. But neither one of us are God. We are tiny pieces of God. We are fractional sections. Here for personal experiences. We have conversed with the other spirits. And decided upon courses of action and lessons to be learned while we are here. All of that was contained in here as well. This was a very good different way of saying the things that I say all the time, that I said all the way through the Bible study. This is contemporaneous with the Old Testament. right? By a reasonable expectation, it is not able to be confirmed to be exact, right? But it is it is a reasonable expectation that it's fairly close to Mosaic, right? To the, the Old Testament of the Bible. Not the New Testament, but the Old Testament. 2500 B.C. is not unreasonable. <clears throat> All right, for the third section today, we are doing Mind Unto Hermes. Mind. Master this sermon then, thrice great Hermes, and bear in mind the spoken words, as it hath come unto me to speak. I will no more delay. So this is Hermes talking with his own mind. Hermes. As many men say many things, and these diverse, about the all in good, I have not learned the truth. 
Make it, then, clear to me, O master mine, for I can trust the explanation of these things which comes from thee alone. Mind, hear then, my son, how standeth God in all? God, eon, cosmos, time, becoming. God maketh eon, eon, cosmos, cosmos, time, and time, becoming. The good, the beautiful wisdom, blessedness, is essence, as it were, of God, of eon, sameness of cosmos order of time change and of becoming life and death the energies of god are mind and soul of eon lastingness of deathlessness of cosmos restoration and the opposite thereof of time increase and decrease and of becoming quality eon then is then in god cosmos in eon in cosmos in cosmos time and in time becoming. Aeon stands firm round God. Cosmos is moved in Aeon. Time hath its limits in the cosmos. Becoming doth become in time. The source, therefore, of all is God. Their essence, Aeon, their matter, cosmos. God's power is Aeon. Aeon's work is cosmos, which never hath become, yet ever doth become by Aeon. Therefore, cosmos never be destroyed, for Eons indestructible, nor doth a wit of things in cosmos perish, for cosmos is enwrapped by eon round on every side. Hermes, but God's wisdom, what is that? Mind, the good and beautiful, and blessedness and virtues all, and eon. Eon then ordereth cosmos, imparting deathlessness and lastingness to matter. For its becoming doth depend on eon, and eon depends on God. Now Genesis and time in heaven and on the earth are of two natures. In heaven they are unchangeable and indestructible, but on the earth they are subject unto change and to destruction. Further, the eon's soul is God, and cosmos's soul is eon, and the earth's soul, heaven, and God's in mind, and mind and soul, and soul and matter, and all of them through eon. But all this body in which are all the bodies is full of soul and soul is full of mind and mind of god it fills it from within and from without encircles it making the all to live without this vast and perfect life cosmos within it fills all lives above in heaven continuing in sameness below on earth changing becoming and eon doth preserve this cosmos or by necessity or by foreknowledge, or by nature, or by whatever else a man supposes, or shall suppose. And all of this, God, energizing. The energy of God is power that naught can ever surpass, a power which no one can make comparison of any human thing at all, or anything divine. Wherefore, O Hermes, never think that aught of things above or things below is like to God, for thou wilt fall from truth. For naught is like that which hath no like, and is alone in one. <clears throat> and do not ever think that any other can possibly possess his power, for what apart from him is there of life, and deathlessness, and change of quality? For what else should he make, God not inactive, since all things would lack activity, for all are full of God? But... Neither in the cosmos anywhere, nor in aught else, is there an action. For that inaction is a name which cannot be applied to either what doth make or what is made. But all things must be made, both ever made and also in accordance with the influence of every space. For he who makes is a nemo, and not established in some one of them, nor making one thing only, but making all. For being power... He energizes in the things he makes and is not independent of them, although the things he makes are subject to him. Now gaze through me upon the cosmos that's now subject to thy sight. Regard its beauty carefully, body in pure perfection, though one than which there's no more ancient one, ever in prime of life and ever young, nay, rather, in even fuller and yet fuller prime. Behold again the seven, seven subject worlds, ordered by Aeon's order, and with their varied course, full-filling Aeon. 
See how all things are full of light, and nowhere is there fire, for tis the love of and blending of the contraries and the dissimilars that doth give birth to light by shining down by the energy of God, the Father of all good, the leader of all order, the ruler of the seven world orderings. Behold the moon, forerunner of them all, the instrument of nature, and the transmuter of lower matter. Look at the earth set in the midst of all, foundation of the cosmos, beautiful, feeder and nurse of all things on earth. And contemplate the multitude of deathless lives, and how great it is, and that of lives subject to death, and midway between both, immortal lives and mortal. See thou the circling moon, and all are full of soul, and all are moved by it, each in its proper way, some round the heaven, and others round the earth. How the right move not unto the left, and nor the yet the left unto the right, nor the above below, nor the below above and that all of these are subject unto Genesis. My dearest Hermes, thou hast no longer need to learn of me, for that they are bodies, have souls, and are moved. But tis impossible for them to come together into one without someone to bring them all together. It must, then, be that such a one as this must be someone who's wholly one. <clears throat> for as many motions of them are all different, and their bodies are not like, Yet has one speed been ordered for them all. It is impossible that there should be two or more makers for them. For that one single order is not kept among the many, but rivalry will follow of the weaker with the stronger, and they will strive. And if the maker of the lives that suffer change and death should be another, he would desire to make the deathless ones as well, just as the maker of the deathless ones to make the lives that suffer death. But come, if there be two, if matter is one and soul is one, in whose hand would there be the distribution for the making? Again, if both of them have some of it, in whose hands may there be the greater part? But thus conceive it then, that every living body doth consist of soul and matter, whether that body be of an immortal, or a mortal, or an irrational life. For all the living bodies are ensouled, whereas, upon the other hand, those that live not are matter by itself. And, in like fashion, soul, when it when itself is, after its own maker, cause of life, but the cause of all life is he who makes the things that cannot die. Hermes. How then is it that first lives subject under death and other than the deathless ones? And next, how is it that life, which knows no death and makes deathlessness, doth not make animals immortal. First, there is someone who does do these things, is clear, and next, that he is also one is very manifest, for also soul is one, and life is one, and matter is one. But who is he? Who may it, who may it other be than the one God? Whom else should it beseem to put soul into lives but God alone? One, then, is God. It would indeed be most ridiculous if, when thou dost confess the cosmos to be one, sun one, moon one, and Godhead one, that thou should wish God himself to be some one or other of a number. All things, therefore, he makes in many ways. And what great thing is it for God to make life, soul, and deathlessness, and change, when thou thyself dost do so many things? For thou dost see, and speak, and hear, and smell, and taste, and touch, and walk, and think, and breathe. And it is not one man who smells, and a second who speaks, and a third who touches, and another one who smells, another one who walks, and another one who thinks, and yet another one who breathes. But one is he who does all these things. And yet no one of these could be apart from God, for just as shouldst thou cease from these, Thou wouldst no longer be a living thing, so also should God cease from them a thing, not law to say, no longer is he God. For if it hath been shown that no thing can be in, can inactive be, how much less God? For if there's aught he doth not make, if it be law to say, he is imperfect. But if he is not only an active but perfect God, then he doth make all things. 
Give thy, thou thyself to me, my Hermes, for a little while, and thou shalt understand more easily how that God's work is one in order that all things may be, that are being made, or once have been, or that are going to be made. And this is my beloved life. This is the beautiful. This is the good. This, God. And if them would in practice understand this work, behold, what taketh place with thee, desiring to beget. Yet this is not a like unto that, for he doth not enjoy. For that indeed he hath no other one to share in what he works. For working by himself he is ever at work, and work himself being what he does. For did he separate himself from it, all things would then collapse, and all must die, life ceasing. But if all things are lives, and also life is one, then one is God. And furthermore, if all are lives, both those in heaven and those on earth, and one life in them is all made to be by God, and God is it, then all are made by God. Life is the making one of mind and soul. Accordingly, death is not the destruction of those that are at one, but dissolving of their union. Eon, moreover, is God's image. Cosmos is an eons, the son of cosmos, and man, the image of the sun. The people call change death, because the body is dissolved in life. When it's dissolved, withdraws to the unmanifest. But in this sermon, Hermes, my beloved, as thou dost hear, I say the cosmos also suffers change, for that a part of it each day is made to be in the unmanifest, yet it is never dissolved. <clears throat> These are the passions of the cosmos, revolvings and concealments. Revolving is conversion and concealment renovation. The cosmos is all formed, not having forms external to itself, but changing them itself within itself. Since then, cosmos is made to be all formed, what may its maker be? For that, on the one hand, he should not be void of all forms, and on the other hand, if he's all formed, he will be like the cosmos. Whereas, again, he has a single form, he will thereby be less than cosmos. What then say we he is, that we may not bring round our sermon into doubt, for not that mind conceives of God is doubtful. He then hath one idea which is his alone, which doth not fall beneath the sight, being bodiless, and yet by means of bodies manifests all, and marvel not that there is a bodiless idea. For it is like the form of reason and mountaintops and pictures, for they appear to stand out strongly from the rest, but really are quite smooth and flat. And now consider what is said more boldly and more truly. Just as man cannot live apart from life, so neither can God live without his doing good. For this is, as it were, the life and motion, as it were, of God, and move all things and make them live. Now, some of the things said should bear a sense peculiar to themselves, so understand, for instance, what I'm going to say. All are in God not as lying in a place, for place is both a body and immovable, and things that lie do not have motion. But now things lie in one way in the bodiless, another way in being made manifest. Think of him who doth contain them all, and think that the bodiless naught is more comprehensive, or swifter, or more potent. But it is the most comprehensive, the swiftest, and most potent of them all. And thus, Think from themselves, and bid thy soul go unto any land, and there more quickly than thy bill bidding will it be, and bid it journey oceanwards, and there again immediately twill be, not as if passing from place to place, but as if being there. And bid it also mount to heaven, and it will need no wings, nor will aught hinder it, nor fire of sun, nor ether, nor vertex whirl nor bodies of the other stars, but cutting through them all, it will soar up to the last body. And shouldst thou will to break through this as well, and contemplate what is beyond, if there be aught beyond the cosmos, it is permitted thee. Behold, what power, what swiftness thou dost have, 
And canst thou do all of these things, and God not do them? Then, in this way, no, God. As having all things in himself as thoughts, the whole cosmos itself. If then thou dost not make thyself like unto God, thou canst not know him, for like is knowable to like. Make thyself to grow to the same stature as the greatness which transcends all measure. Leap forth from everybody, transcend all time, become eternity, and thus shalt you know God. Conceiving nothing is impossible unto itself, think thyself deathless, and able to know all, all arts, all sciences, the way of every life. Become more lofty than all height, and lower than all depth. Collect into thyself all senses of all creatures, of fire and water and dry and moist. Think that thou art at the same time in every place, in earth and sea and sky, yet not begotten, in the womb, young, old, dead, in after death conditions. And if you knowest all these things at once, times, places, doings, qualities, and quantities, thou canst know God. But if thou lockest up thy soul within thy body and dost debase it, saying, I know nothing, I nothing can, I fear the sea, I cannot scale the sky, I know not who I was, who I shall be, what is there between God and thee? For thou canst know naught of things beautiful and good, so long as thou dost love thy body and art bad. The, goodest, the greatest bad there is, is not to know God's good, but to be able to know good and will and hope is a straight way, the good's own path, both leading there and easy. But if thou setst thy foot thereon, twill meet thee everywhere, twill everywhere be seen, both where and when thou dost not expect it, waking, sleeping, sailing, journeying, by night, by day, speaking, and saying not, for there is naught that is not the image of good. Hermes, is God unseen? Mind, hush, who is more manifest than he? For this is one reason hath he made all things, that through them all thou may see him. This is the good of God, this is virtue, that he may be made manifest through all. For naught's unseen, even of things that are without a body, mind seeth itself in thinking, God in making. So far these things have been made manifest to thee, thrice greatest one. Reflect on all the rest in the same way within thyself, and thou shalt not be led astray. And I don't think we are going to get to the fourth one today, and we're going to go ahead and start wrapping this one up, because we're getting close to an hour, and I like to keep them digestible. <clears throat> All three of these passages are telling you the same thing, right? We talked about God is everything. We talked about the threefold nature of God, and this is telling you that you have control of everything. Manifestation is a power with which you have been blessed. You may not understand that as of yet. This might be the first video, and if so, you should definitely check out the Infinite Integrations playlist where we talk in detail about some of the things that you can do. You can speak into existence. The toroid that comes out of your mouth creates the reality that you have. If you wake up every morning and you say today is going to be a wonderful day, it will probably be a wonderful day. If you wake up every day and you say today is going to be a shitty day, it's probably going to be a shitty day. You are creating that with the words out of your mouth. There are other ways to create. You can create with your hands. You can create with your mind. You can create. It has been given unto you because you are a tiny piece of God. You are not God. You are not allowed to interfere in other people's lives. The eight rules of creation are a thing for a reason. But you can create everything that is within the will of God for you to create. Sometimes that is beneficial. Sometimes it is not. Or not all the lessons are easy ones. This, all three of these sections were to tell you that you are part of God. You have been endowed with creation, but there is a price to pay for them. You must be diligent. You must be serving the good. You must be following the laws of creation. You must be serving the good. If you're not, then the eight laws of creation, three times, will be there to bite you in your ass. 
Hopefully I brought a little bit of enlightenment, not too much confusion to a somewhat complicated topic. If you have questions or concerns, you can leave them down below and we will address them. Most of this to me is self-evident. I try to expound a little bit, not too much so it's not overbearing, but this is all saying the same thing that I say all the time. God loves you. To the crew, thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you were here with me and I am praying for you every single day. Until next time, I love you. God loves you. You are perfect, whole, and complete, just the way that you are. And this has been Pitt's Take. Peace.